Imagine cutting a continent in half, carving a path through mountains and jungles, battling disease, political chaos, and engineering failures, all to connect two oceans. That's exactly what it took to build the Panama Canal, one of the most ambitious projects in human history. For centuries, people dreamed of a shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Spanish were the first to seriously consider it. In 1513, Vasco Nunez de Balboa became the first European to cross Panama and see both oceans. The Spanish realized that a canal would be a game changer for trade, but 16th century technology wasn't up to the task. Instead, they built an overland route, the Las Cruces Trail, to move goods between the coasts. This route, while useful, was slow and expensive, requiring goods to be transported by mule or carried by hand. By the 1800s, as global trade exploded, the idea of a canal returned. The California Gold Rush of 1849 sent thousands of prospectors scrambling to reach the Pacific, and Panama became a major transit point. The US even built a railroad across Panama to speed up the journey. However, the dream of a canal persisted. Then came Ferdinand de Lesseps, the man who successfully built the Suez Canal in Egypt. He thought he could do the same in Panama. In 1881, he launched a grand project, convinced that a sea-level canal was the way to go. However, Panama wasn't Egypt. The thick jungles, torrential rains, and steep terrain made construction nearly impossible. Worst of all, mosquitoes carrying malaria and yellow fever were everywhere. Workers, engineers, and entire families fell victim to disease. Over 22,000 workers died, and by 1889, the French project collapsed in financial ruin, leaving behind half-dug trenches, rusting equipment, and shattered dreams. By the early 1900s, the US wanted the canal badly. The Spanish-American War of 1898 had highlighted the need for a faster route between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Without a canal, US battleships had to sail all the way around South America to reach the Pacific, a journey of over 13,000 miles, which could take months and left the Navy vulnerable in times of war. American politicians and military strategists saw the canal as crucial for both national security and economic expansion. But there was one problem. Panama was still part of Colombia. The US tried negotiating a deal offering Colombia millions of dollars for the rights to build a canal, but the Colombian government refused. Frustrated, President Theodore Roosevelt took matters into his own hands. In 1903, he backed Panama's independence movement, sending U.S. warships to the coast as a show of force. With U.S. support, Panama declared independence from Colombia. And then, within days, the Panamanian government signed a treaty granting the U.S. full control over the canal zone, an agreement that many Panamanians later resented for being forced upon them. The first challenge? Disease. More workers had died from mosquitoes than from the actual construction. Enter Dr. William Gorgas, a U.S. Army doctor who had fought yellow fever in Cuba. Gorgas led a massive effort to wipe out disease-carrying mosquitoes, draining swamps, fumigating buildings, and spreading oil on standing water. The scale of this public health campaign was unprecedented. Thousands of workers were employed just to hunt down mosquito breeding grounds, install drainage systems, and quarantine infected individuals. By 1906, yellow fever was nearly gone and malaria rates had plummeted. For the first time, workers could actually survive long enough to finish the project. Now the digging could begin. Instead of a sea level canal like the French had attempted, American engineers designed a lock based system to lift ships over the mountainous terrain. The locks would function like giant water elevators, raising and lowering ships as needed. It was a revolutionary approach that required precision engineering and careful water management. The biggest challenge was the Calubra Cut, a deep trench that had to be carved through solid rock. Workers blasted through the mountain using dynamite, steam shovels, and sheer brute force. Landslides constantly threatened progress, burying equipment and setting the project back by months at a time. The work was grueling, with shifts lasting up to 10 hours a day in the scorching jungle heat. Engineers had to devise new techniques to stabilize the terrain, reinforce the slopes, and keep the canal route clear. One of the canal's most crucial features was the Gatun Lake, an artificial lake created by damming the Chagres River. This allowed ships to travel through Panama without having to dig a full sea-level trench across the entire country. 
The massive Gatun locks were built to control the water level, ensuring a smooth passage for ships of all sizes. The lake also served as a vital water reservoir, supplying the locks with millions of gallons of water needed for each transit. Thousands of workers, many from the Caribbean, labored in harsh conditions to make the canal a reality. Racial discrimination was rampant. White workers from the US were paid in gold, while black and Caribbean workers were paid in silver, reflecting a brutal hierarchy. Many of these workers faced dangerous conditions, including deadly landslides and heat exhaustion, yet they pushed forward. By the time the canal was completed, over 75,000 workers had participated in the effort. Finally, after years of relentless work, the canal was ready. On August 15, 1914, the first official transit took place. The SS Ankin made history as the first ship to pass through the Panama Canal. The world had its shortcut and global trade would never be the same. For decades, the US controlled the canal, reaping the economic and strategic benefits. The canal allowed American naval power to move quickly between oceans, strengthening the country's global influence. The US also collected substantial revenue from the canal tolls, further cementing its dominance over world trade. But many Panamanians weren't happy. The canal was in their country, yet they had no say over it. The canal zone was treated as US territory, with American-style schools, housing, and clubs that were off-limits to Panamanians. Tensions grew over the years, leading to protests and riots. By the 1960s, demands for the Panamanian control became impossible to ignore. In 1977, US President Jimmy Carter and Panama's leader Omar Torrios signed the Torrios-Carter Treaties, agreeing that the US would hand over the canal by the year 2000. Many Americans feared that Panama wouldn't be able to manage such a massive operation, but the transition went smoothly. On December 31, 1999, the canal officially became Panamanian property. It was a historic moment. Panama had finally regained control over one of the most important waterways in the world. Since then, Panama has modernized and expanded the canal to accommodate larger ships. In 2016, a massive expansion project was completed, adding new locks that allow even bigger vessels to pass through. This $5.25 billion expansion doubled the canal's capacity, ensuring its continued relevance in global trade. Today, over 14,000 ships a year use the canal, carrying about 5% of all global trade. But the future isn't certain. Climate change has led to droughts that reduce water levels, affecting ship traffic, and competition from other shipping routes like the Arctic's melting sea lanes could change global trade patterns. Political tensions in Panama could also impact the canal's operations. One thing is for sure, what was once a wild dream of explorers and engineers is now one of the most vital waterways in the world, and its story is far from over.